Hey, this is Chaos Paper Tape, and today you join me for another episode of Elu Base. And today I'm launching a station. Um, you may think be thinking, wait, but you launched a station last time. But this one is going to Elu, which is much um, so the station is much smaller. It's mainly a fuel tank, RCS, and a little bit of keythane tanks and various things. I'll talk through it later. But basically, um, I want there to be a station around Elu, so that um. I can dock to it and rendezvous and refuel my crafts so that I can bring people to and from Elu with ease. There'll also be fuel on the Kerbin station in the future, um, and then that will serve as basically a go-between so that I can have crafts constantly in space that act as my kind of space buses, I guess. Um, so basically what you're saying here is just a very heavy launch vehicle, um, take a very heavy payload into orbit. And to get it out to Min, uh, to not Minmus, that would be easy. To get it out to Elu, um, I'm going to be using three nuclear engines using the fuel in the station, because I'm not going to take the, in a whole fuel tank, a full fuel tank out to Elu, because that would just be pointless. So, um, because I'm going to refuel it at Elu with keythane. That's why there are keythane things, are keythane tanks on there. I don't think I'll be doing too much kind of keythane stuff with this. Um, station. Hopefully, I'll be able to kind of turn the keythane into fuel on the ground. But there is a generator on top which uses keythane to make power. Um, so maybe I'll have that in the future just in case stuff um, goes wrong or emergency power. And I haven't really kind of um, planned too much of this. Uh, I've just kind of put a bunch of docking ports. There'll be one senior docking port, two junior docking ports, and two normal docking ports. Just um, Oh, and there's a nice explosion as I ditch the transfer stage and fix the inclination with the nuclear engine. Anyway, that is in orbit. Um, so I think I'm ready to plan my maneuver out to Elu after I've opened up my solar panels. And um, well, this is post commentary, so I'm not exactly sure where where I am. But okay, now I think we're back. Yeah, 2,000 delta V burn, and I've actually cut down the delta V of this whole maneuver maneuver quite a lot um, because I'm doing the inclination change much further away from the sun which makes it which it's basically about a third of the delta V which is ridiculous I'm gonna start doing that a lot more but some things go a little wrong as you will see uh, later um, and I kind of lose a little bit of fuel over that but I'm not too worried because I have found if, if you saw the last um, episode I have found fields of keythane around Elu so I will be able to fuel the station with as much fuel as I can carry hopefully um, when I send some keythane stuff out there and what I'm doing right now is not burning directly down um, not directly down directly where because the blue marker says to be pointing at about a 45 degree angle down but that will pretty much deorbit me and that'll be a little annoying and you can see I have my orbit info on screen, and I've, my periaps is 74 kilometers and dropping fast. This is at four times time accelerate, but it still was dropping quite fast. And yes, I am using MechJerb, not because it's an easy button, just because of orbit info. I don't really use it for much else. Um, I just I just find MechJerb to be useful, and I like to have lots of um, information on my screen because you know that's how a real spacecraft would have it. Um, and as you may notice. This has a crew canister, but isn't crewed. Um, well, it's a hitchhiker storage container, and it has a probe. It's because it's not a crew station, it's a docking station, and it can hold four crew, um, and, and probably will at some point, but it's not. that's not its main intention, and I was trying to keep mass fairly low, because I didn't want to have to... Oh, I, I don't know. I, I just didn't want to have an absolutely huge station around Elu, which would be too complicated and then maybe I hit it with a spacecraft, it breaks and then I have to send something out there, it would just be a lot of work. And you know me, I don't like trying. Um, anyway, we've escaped Kerbin. I, I, I'm trying, I'm, I'm taking a freaking station out to Elu. Uh, yeah, so we have about 700 Delta V left and quite a lot of fuel, we've burned kind of over a thousand litres right now, oh no, a thousand litres of oxidizer, almost two thousand litres, eight hundred litres of fuel. I'm kind of, yeah, just reading numbers and getting them wrong. I'm good at numbers, <laughs> clearly, which is bad because I'm doing double maths at A-level, so uh <laughs> going to pass them. Anyway, uh, 
Ooh, okay, so what's this? What's happening now? Okay, oh, basically it's burning. I should have maybe cut this down a little bit, but it, it's fine. It's, you know. Um, so I have Conic Patch Mode on something. I don't know. Basically, it means I can see what I'll be encountering in the future. And what you can see might, be, might have noticed right now, which I didn't notice at the time, is I have two encounters. One of them is a dual encounter, and one of them is an ELO encounter. Um, okay, apparently I don't have now. Okay, yeah, there, there you go. And you can see it's there again. And I didn't notice this at first, but then I saw, I was like, oh crap, I'm going to get to duel, and then I cancel some things. Um, and then I realized this will probably be happening on screen somewhere soonish, the duel encounter. I was like, oh crap. So I canceled that, not noticing that I was going to get to Elu anyway. And then I realized um, a little later that uh, that I could use a gravity assist to get to Elu, and that'll look really cool. And then I realized I have conic draw limit. I think I keep saying conic patch mode, but I mean conic draw limit set to 4, which means I can see where I'm going to be in the future. Um, and yeah, you can see I'm getting very confused there, but uh, where, where I'll be in the future. So it actually means I'm going to get to Elu, and if I don't do anything around Elu, I'll fly w right round and get to Jewel. And that's not where I want to be. But uh, at this point in time, in the recording, I hadn't noticed. Um, I hadn't noticed what was really happening. Uh, yeah, so you can see I have... Uh, Periaps around Elu and Jewel. I think that's what it looked like. I'm pointing with my hands, but you can't see it. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping you can't see it. Maybe you have telescopes. The government are watching me, man. Yeah. Anyway, you can see that it's actually only a 337 delta V burn as opposed to my usual about a thousand delta V burn because it's much further away from the sun. And the further away from your orbital body, the m is the easier it is to. Um, to, to perform inclination changes. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the science behind that, but I'm sure as uh, I'm sure some of you know of something called the Oberth effect. So if you burn nearer your body, you'll need less delta V to raise your apoaps. Um, but it's kind of the opposite way around for inclination changes, which is why I usually change my inc um, fine tune my inclination on the on like on um, when I'm just quite near to the planet, so uh, as I've just entered the sphere of influence, but I'm still like quite far away, if that made sense. Anyway, um, so you can see I've still got my two encounters. I think I'd figured it out by this point. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm. No, oh, now I have problems because I'm trying to uh, focus on Elu and set up um, a maneuver node, but that didn't go very well. So I decided to hell with maneuver nodes. I'm just going to eyeball it because I eyeball most of my maneuvers because I kind of I, I understand the navball now basically. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've burned uh, at, at 270 degrees to bring it in laterally, and now I'm going to burn upwards to bring it... Okay, no, that was wrong. I think, yeah, going to burn north, obviously, um, so to bring it up longitudinally. I'm going to bring it upwards, basically, my um, where I'm going to be, because I want to be... You can see it's jumping around everywhere, but... My periaps is now on the right side of the planet because I want it to have my I want to have my orbit in the same direction as all of my other probes and the rotation of Elu because that'll make it easy to get away from Elu and that's how I bring in all of my craft and it's very important for a station um, because obviously I'm going to be bringing in spacecraft constantly and they all need to have the same orbit so it's not just hitting each other at about four thousand meters a second. Um, That'd be really bad. Um, I have actually left this, you can see I'm time warping now, um, and then I lose my encounter, which is bad. I left this in because because of this, because I le lose my encounter now, and to kind of get across the idea of how far away Elu is, how long it takes to warp there. Um, and I did a video on rescaled Kerbin. I cannot imagine how annoying, how just horrifying it must be to um, get there, um, no, to like get to I think it's actually Val that's in place for Pluto on um on a uh, rescale Kerbin. How horrible it must be to time warp out there because in real life Voyager One, uh, which has recently left the solar system, when it w from the time it was launched from Earth to the time it got to Pluto when it did its flyby of Pluto, that was nine years. It took nine years to get there. You can see right now I'm just messing around with maneuver nodes trying to re get my to get my encounter. Because I actually lost my encounter, so now I have to perform a 180 delta V burn to um, regain that encounter, which you can see there. So I basically just kind of do it because I have a whole orange tank, so it's not exactly a, 
a problem. And I've got a Jewel encounter again, because Jewel always seems to be in the way when I'm going to Elu, or if I miss Elu in this case. So yeah. Um, but yeah, Voyager 1, that's very interesting. I'm sure a lot of people have just kind of heard of that, because, um, well, it's been quite big in the news, because it's the first, uh, oh look, someone's playing Starbound. <laughs> um, I don't actually know that guy, he always pops up in my videos, don't know him, he's just a friend on Steam, don't remember why, but you know. Um, was it? Oh yeah, Voyager 1, that's the, uh, the spacecraft that took the iconic blue dot photo, which almost wasn't taken for various reasons. Um, but we have a picture of Earth from outside our solar system, which is really incredible. It doesn't have very much scientific value, weirdly enough, but it has kind of, um, it's a really nice photo. I think, uh, no, I won't, but I, I was thinking of setting that as my um, background on my computer, but my computer background is a Mars sunset, because, um, well, there's been tons of pictures taken of the Mars sunset. I'll just talk about real space whilst I'm time warping. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mars. Um, I think my s the sunset on my screen has been taken by the Mars rover because the Mars rover can take quite a lot of photos because it has um, nuclear generators which create enough power to level small cities. That That's not true. I, don't, I was just quoting something from the description of the skipper engine on this game. But no. But I think the first ever sunset or sunrise on Mars was taken by um, the Titan I lander, which was a lander to the first lander ever to land on Mars, which was, it, its purpose was to find life. There was, I was reading a book about it, um, and a boy, uh, it was, I think Titan 1 and Titan 2 did a biological test to test for uh, life in the soil of Mars. Um, in con well, they were very inconclusive for a while, there was a huge thing about it, like, um, the press went crazy the second, uh, because it looked at first like Titan 1 had found life on Mars and everyone was very excited about it, but the scientists wouldn't just say, well, we found life on Mars, because imagine if they were wrong, which it kind of looked like their experiments are wrong. Um, well, they, they were they were inconclusive in general, but the, the press jumped to the fact that there's life on Mars, because then everyone's going to buy that paper, and then the next day they're thinking, okay, there's something wrong with our experiments, and then when Titan II landed, it looked a lot, li a lot more like there wasn't life on Mars, and we still don't fully know. Um, Obviously, I mean, there might be l microbes in the soil. Um, it doesn't look like there's any space tigers or space cobras or awful Prometheus things, but, um, I mean, there's... I, do, I actually... I'm not surprisingly not that um, uh, expert in the field of astrobiology, as it's called. But, yeah, the Titan 1 and the Titan 2 landers, I believe they were called Titan. I'm really scared that they're not now, because then I'm going to sound like a, a buffoon. Um, but yeah, I believe that's what they were called, and uh, yeah, so they uh, they were the first things to look for life on Mars, and they were very impressive. And what I'm doing right now on screen um, is just, uh, uh, yeah, address, adjusting my orbit around, not my orbit, my inclination and periaps around ELU. Um, yeah. Wait, was there significance to what I was talking about, Mars? Oh yeah, um, it tried to them on, it took the first photo of... Um, you know, the a sunset on Mars, and it was, uh, yeah, pretty iconic photo. Anyway, so now I'm doing my retrograde burn, and here I'm just planning it just to see kind of how long it'll take. Um, and there's Elu for... I've gotten, you know, fairly good at going to Elu. I mean, I screwed up a bit here, and I've kind of fixed it without too much, uh, too much problem. And there's the crater on Elu I always recognize. I mean, it's skipping past at four times time accelerate, but there's a crater I originally planned to land in, but didn't because it went into the dark side of the um, into the dark side of Elu, so I didn't want that to be on the video. Something uh, NASA don't have to kind of concern themselves with so much. And this is at four times time accelerate, so I kept flicking out of map view and into um, normal view. So this probably looks all very crazy, but I'm just trying to slow myself down. I've forgotten the exact um, orbital velocity around Elu, but I think it's around 600 meters a second. Um, and I'm just about to pass, well, now I've just passed my uh, periaps and I'm now rising again. I do get quite high before I actually, um, um, I, I get quite high before I actually, yeah, uh, get on orbit around, um, uh, Elu. And you just saw I did a crew report. You can actually do a crew report with an empty capsule for some reason. Anyway. That's a day away. Jeez. Imagine waiting a day to exit. 
Igloo. I mean, obviously, spa most space travel maneuvers take a long time. In real life, to get to the moon, um, it's usually... I'm not sure of the entire mission length, actually. That's awful. I think it's three days out there um, and three days back. I think usually most of the Apollo missions that landed on the moon were about a week long, which was why there was so much kind of problem with things like um, Apollo 13, the one that uh, they did a film about that went horribly wrong. They had to kind of cut that mission short because um, well, there were obviously various problems with power and such. Um, Although it wasn't cut that short because they uh, they actually had to go out to the moon and then just adjust some things to come back. That was a uh, well. That was um, there's a lot of things about the number thirteen because obviously Apollo thirteen and it was on the thirteenth. It was launched on one o'clock and it got there on the thirteenth of the month or something. And a lot of people were very superstitious about that. I I don't believe any any of that kind of thing. But um, I mean it's so I guess it's 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 still odd that there were so many thirteens involved in that. But anyway, uh, what am I doing now? Oh yeah, I need to fix my inclination. And basically I start eyeballing it because uh, there's nothing, there's no reference frame. And then I realize a little later that on this orbit info um, panel, there's a nice little incl in inclination indicator, which I don't notice for a while. Yeah, I'm uh, making a lot of bad decisions. Oh, and I've uh, been watching Kerbalcom. That's uh, been on yesterday and today. Um, yeah, this will be uploaded tonight, so yeah, it's been on today. Might even still be on by the time you're watching this, but probably not. It's been really interesting. There's been a lot of um, talk about point .23, uh, a lot of awesome things coming in that. So, um, yeah, well, I might as well talk about them. I mean, if you haven't been watching it, um, there's uh, there's obviously the science, there's this science lab. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the science lab, which means you can do science in space, and I think get more science transmitting things back. But one of the things I'm most interested in is this new jet engine which it's called the rapier as in the sword um it's named after the uh, a type of sword called the rapier um and it's uh it's a liquid fuel and jet engine so it's it's partly jet engine and then switches over to liquid fuel and that's very cool and right now oh, i'm still just fixing my inclination on screen so i can talk about things um and I think the one of the there's just a lot of uh, small changes, a few new parts, uh, probably a few changes to career mode, and they're looking at every single line of code, I believe, to try and make it slightly more efficient. So um, your game might run slightly faster. So that's that's always good. Okay, my inclination's pretty good, and I was trying to get it perfect, then I gave up. Well, no, I still haven't given up. Look at me, just going nuts. Uh, I'm being ridiculous. I think um, I gave up pretty soon. I hope so, because I'm running out of things to talk about. I mean, I've covered the Mars landers, those are cool. Um, there's another, I've forgotten what year it's going out, probably before 2020, um, the next Mars rover, much, uh, it's a lot heavier duty. Um, it's going to be exploring below the surface of Mars rather than just the normal surface. Anyway, um, that's looking good, so that's our station in orbit. Let's get rid of the, uh, get rid of those engines kind of wiggle them free a bit I guess. I don't have any control on this now except kind of um, like rotational control. Okay, one second. Okay, lots of problems. What happened there is I had been watching something when I was recording this bit where I'm calling this station the Andromeda station. Um, but I've been recording something and that, um, uh, so uh, I've been recording while watching Kerbalcon, so there was a little bit of commentary in there you probably just heard on my speaker, on my microphone. Um, and annoyingly, I've just realized the video has been playing slightly slower than I've been recording, so I'll have lots of fun syncing that up. Um, that'll be awful. So anyway, this has been KSP with Tape. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it's not too out of sync, because I've got to fix that now. Oh, bloody hell. That's awful. Anyway, um, this has been KSP with Tape. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will see you next time.